Gerald back. Okay, Gerald, before you get frozen again, make me a co-host. <laughs> Okay, I see Stephanie, I see Polly. Hi there, this is Stephanie. Welcome, I see Samantha. Pastor Hodges. James. Did I count right? We have eight, right? That's all we need for quorum, correct? I believe we needed. Oh, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, we had eight last time. Okay. So with that, two, two, three, four, five, six. Hey, I'm not in. I don't see, I see y'all, but y'all don't see me. <laughs> you gotta turn on your camera. It, I, it's not, I don't have no, it is on. He's in the attendees list. Hmm. And yes, we're recording, so we should be live. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. So we need to change it into a panelist also. Okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna go, there we are. Okay, you're good to go. All right, I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order at 6.07. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for your patience as we undergo technological difficulties. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now that we are welcoming everyone. I want to acknowledge we also have um, uh, Chief Shiloh as well as Captain Jordan with us this um, evening. Welcome, welcome. And our Executive Director, Reverend Ger Gerald Brown. And with that, we're going to turn it over. Do we have the city staff with us? Mr. Brown? Your, your microphone's off. No, ma'am, not as yet. Not as of yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. I know Ms. Jenkins um, is prepared as always to remind us of the purpose of the Citizens Advisory Board and Police and Community Relations. So I will turn it over to her to give an overview of our board for those of you that are visiting us for the first time. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this board was founded under um, 26.0801 with a purpose and intent of 
creating a citizens advisory board on police and community relations, which shall study, consult and advise the mayor, city council and city manager or police community relations crime prevention efforts. The board shall function as a method of community participation in recommending and reviewing policies, practices and programs designed to make law enforcement sensitive, effective and responsive to the needs of the city. It shall actively encourage and foster citizen participation in crime prevention efforts. It is further intended that the board shall promote and encourage open communication and cooperation between the police department and residents of the city. Recognizing the policing of the city of San Diego is a shared responsibility. The board shall also develop and make recommendations directed towards informing the community of its rights and responsibilities when coming into contact with police officers. Thank you. And now we'll turn to roll call. Mr. Ilko. There we go. Uh, Polly Dong. Present. Uh, Kathleen Fisher. James Holliday. Present. Pastor Hodges. Present. I am here, uh, Vice Chair Jenkins. President. Uh, Chair Sandoval is here, Jack Schaefer. Oh, here. Bill Falheimer. And Stephanie Perez. President. So we have uh, two, four, six, eight to two, we're here. Thank you. All right, we're now going to turn to non-agenda public comment. Were any uh, notices turned in? No, ma'am. No. There were none. Not, do we have any agenda public comments? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay, so neither one or the other. Okay, we're going to turn now to um, SDPD for the department report. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll be just talking about a few things. And first, I just want to talk about um, Chief Guayram. If you guys are not aware, he'll be um, having a well-deserved retirement next month. So he's got a month left. Um, so based on that, we'll be doing promotions um, sometime in mid-May, um, um, you know, promoting kind of every rank, executive chief, uh, one assistant chief, and on down the line. Um, so we'll have those um, effective, I think, toward the end of um, uh, May. And then um, with the Chauvin case, we are um, getting prepared for any protests here in San Diego. Um, we have detectives in uniform. Um, we're definitely aware of the one year anniversary of Floyd's death um, coming up on the 25th. So, you know, we, we're just kind of preparing for any, any um, protests here in San Diego. Um, another thing um, with the governor making an announcement that with COVID and stuff, kind of opening up the state June 15th, um, we're looking at a lot of, um, and I have special events where um, a lot of requests are coming in for events toward, you know, after June, including, you know, with the 4th of July weekend. So we're definitely um, preparing for that also um, as, as the state opens up. And then um, last week we had um, Academy graduation on Friday, 48 um, recruits. Um, graduated, so they still have four months of phase training, but you know that's a welcome addition. And then next, actually April 26th on Monday, we have another 50 recruits starting the academy. So we have an orientation this Friday where all the chiefs and captains will talk to them. So um, other than that, that, that's my report for today. I'm curious, how are the officers feeling right now with the with the hearing with the uh, trial now on a stage where it's at have you noticed any have they been voicing it their concerns or their anxiety yeah i think everybody's aware you know with closing comments this week and hopefully a verdict pretty soon uh, the officers are just you know kind of waiting to see what the verdict is going to be waiting to see whether you know they're going to have any protests here in San Diego, so I, I know the officers are talking and kind of just waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, 
Madam Mr. Chair, may I, may, may I ask the chief a question, uh, if possible? Chief, uh, has, has your and, and uh, intelligent or have folks put in for a, a possible march or uh, you know protest as as they normally do? Have any folks already put in for uh, the twenty fifth? To your knowledge, no. As of yeah, as of today, we haven't had any protests. Um, anybody put in for a protest? But we know that it's going to be day to day. Has you know as things kind of. Um, see what's going to happen. So things will probably pop up. So, but as of today, we, we have no planned protests. Thank you, sir. And I wanted to ask Jack uh, um, from the Police Officers Association, have you heard anything? Have you seen a shift in, in, in morale or what are officers on the ground saying about this anticipated verdict? Well, I haven't heard a whole lot of talk about the verdict. I mean, that comes down to a jury. Um, but I think that uh, there's just a lot of uh, emotional fatigue um, from our officers just because, I mean, basically for the last year, they've been in some sense of uh, heightened awareness, um, a lot of overtime stuff. So, I mean, that's, what I, that's mostly what I'm seeing. Um, I don't know that too many people, I mean, they, they work enough to where I don't know that they're sitting around watching too much of the of the of the uh, trial itself. Um, but it, you know, um, either way that the verdict would go, there's potential for mm -hmm. um, you know a lot of unrest. So I think that's mostly what I'm seeing is just that you know it's like you know it's, it seems like um, every other week or so there's something happening where they do have do have to be on that heightened alert, um, and that's. Um, that's that can be uh, taxing on somebody's um you know emotional well-being and and just just fatigue in general yeah i was uh considering how um it could weigh in like you said either way if it's if it turns out that he is guilty i can see the the validation um that many community members may have and that would help appease a lot of the anxiety but at the same time it could heighten you know a lot of the our, our younger um, youth being more overt and more um because i'm thinking as an educator right you can't suspend me miss sandoval <laughs> and being just that more vocal or more defiant if you will um and i just say that to to caution our, our leaders um our young leaders our young um community members that um, we want to exert our, our democratic um, right, but just be cautious, please, uh, of, of how we all manifest our joy or are upset because in the counterpart, if the verdict does result against a guilty plea, um, there will be a lot of upset. And so understanding how to how do you, what, what else do you do from that? You know, what else can we do from having that and, and being upset to finding a solution, you know, and every single board member on this board believes that there is that middle ground. We all believe that, that including my conversations with, with the chiefs, that there is work to be done, but it can't all be placed on the police. One thing that I've learned as an educator has been that you really need to have a coalition of people on both sides to bring those positive results. So I, I invite our leaders to, to consider possible options on how can we in San Diego, uh, we can't always control our na nation, right? but what, here in San Diego in our, in our city, what can be done to improve that, improve our relationship, improve the, um, the trust that that is um, placed on our officers and uh, and continue building on that work. Today we're going to talk a little bit more about the recommendations that CAB has made, so we'll be able to discuss some of those other options. Any other questions, board members, or comments um, regarding anything that that 
that the chief mentioned. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming in and uh, we'll be sharing more about um, through our executive director, a little bit more about our nation's uh, uproar and many other um, areas. Uh, we currently, are we, do we still now have the, our, our city's director of community of the boards and commissions? Has Mr. Gordon logged in? Uh, no, ma'am, he has not. Okay. I'll be giving a report on that, um, a meeting I had with him earlier this morning, later on during my chair report. Uh, let's move now to the executive director report. Uh, yes, ma'am. Give me give me just a second here. Um, so the executive director, again, we'd like to thank uh, Chief Charlo for supplying the folks for, for COVID-19, uh, for the response team. Uh, they did a great job and we, uh, the mayor has, uh, has recognized them and we will be getting those citations uh, over to you, Chief, uh, soon. Uh, we are still not out of the woods, as the chief mentioned. Uh, we are still receiving complaints in, uh, even though they're minimized. And then we are also, uh, the COVID team has been working uh, with uh, VICE, uh, if you will, to, to go out and make folks continually aware, even though uh, it seems like we're open up to the world, uh, we have not in, uh, opened up completely. And so the, the governor has announced today, uh, I think that's May 15th or June 15th when he is going to, uh, the restrictions are going to be off, but for now we're still wearing masks everywhere that we uh, that we go, and we're still uh, encouraging people to do that, and especially at City Hall. Uh, the next item is uh, the Asian Pacific Island Summit. Uh, I attended the Asian uh, Pacific Island uh, Summit uh, against hate. Uh, as you know, the API community has been uh, receiving and uh, involved in, in a lot of hate and abuse uh, towards them. Uh, I believe that they are in the uh, seventh area. And so we did in fact talk to the council member. Uh, we, we met with the mayor, the police chief, the district attorney uh, and other law enforcement officers that were out that day to tour uh, the community there. Um, we talked about a lot of hate issues that are going on in the API community and how they can take, uh, you know, and protect themselves from some of the issues and how they get in contact with law enforcement if there is an issue. One of the thoughts was that um, here as a part of CAB, that we need to ensure that we are in every community and that we're hearing the voice of, of everyone. And so uh, that's why we made sure that we were out there for that. Um, we attended uh, the San Diego Department uh, Use of Force Training. Uh, they held it out at probation. Um, it seemed to be a good training that was opened up to, to um, to answering whatever questions that community members had. Uh, they had three different scenarios. I would encourage that uh, the, the board, that if they have not been through uh, that training, the use of force training, where they put you in multiple scenarios uh, to give you an idea of what uh, the police officers experiencing at that time. And then also they're looking for feedback on how they can improve uh, the use of force. The trainers were from the from the uh, San Diego Police Department and from the Academy. And so they're giving you in a small time, about four hours, uh, a little taste of, of what the officers receive uh, while they're going through training. And again, this was uh, organized by uh, Standing in the Gap uh, and the Police Chief uh, Association. Uh, I think it would be good, uh, just a recommendation to the board that if you have not been a part of going out to those types of meetings and inside San Diego Police Department, uh, and also making these uh, trainings available to community members, uh, not only taking it out to probation, but actually taking it out to the different uh, divisions uh, and to the different communities so they can see what the use of force training is. Uh, with that going on, uh, Madam Chair, to uh, national impact, uh, community policing. Uh, of course, in the news, you know, there's been some issue about an officer um, grabbing her her uh, gun and, and actually shooting an individual. Uh, that individual uh, young man died. 
uh, difference between the use of taser. And so we may want to receive training here in San Diego on how our police department uh, and law enforcement agencies around the corner, around the, the county use, uh, are taught the use of tasers, uh, pepper spray, and how they're trained to know the difference between when they're grabbing their their taser and they're going to use that and what all that entails and uh, and when they're grabbing their weapon. And so uh, that might be something to, uh, to pass on for training. Uh, we have so many different incidents that have happened uh, throughout the nation right now, uh, where it's involving law enforcement and involving shootings, uh, as well as mass shootings. And so, uh, again, we need to make sure that the community is aware and that the community is receiving training. As I understand it, the San Diego Police Department uh, has, a, uh, has a trailer uh, and a training uh, where they can go out and bring people in and actually put the, the best on them and let them go through and make moment uh, by moment decisions. And that's something that CAB can in fact, uh, together with PD, uh, sponsor for the community. Also, there's some other issues that are coming up and we'll talk about those a little bit later on as we go through uh, the process. Uh, on the Commission on Police Practices, uh, Brandon uh, is their chairman, uh, is on uh, vacation and he couldn't make it this evening, but I will pass on to you that, that uh, Charmaine is in the process of working to, to staff up the uh, Commission on Police Practices. Uh, they are dealing with uh, approximately 70 complaints uh, that are out there. Uh, and you'll hear about maybe one of them this evening. Uh, and they really need for the community to have a voice in, in what's going on. And so uh, that has been our task to bring the community in and to marry them together as, as law enforcement and community to get to understand. We have issues here in San Diego, but when we take a look at across the country, um, we are, are working towards hopefully solving those issues and having the voice of the people heard. That is my report, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. And yes, you're, you're absolutely right. It's important um, that, you know, our role as CAV, like you said, is to facilitate the, the training because I think oftentimes, like I, I was able to watch a documentary this weekend um, called Baltimore Rising, I think that's what it's called. And, and it highlights the, the two ways by which organizers or, or the youth um, express their their anger at what happened in Baltimore. And you see the path that, you know, one young man takes, I think he came notorious, uh, he stood up to um, Gerardo, the, 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 the celebrity. And, and the young man was very passionate, right, about the, the and angry about what had happened. But it ended up costing him his job it ended up costing him um you know feeling his, his parents were upset at him and um he also got arrested and charged so now he has a, um, a misdemeanor on his in his record and so uh, on the other side you see a young man who's also a former gang member also upset quiet but he learned that the way that you move your initiatives forward is exactly through uh, the system, right? Using the system to to support it. And you know, I was that young lady that that back in the when I was nineteen, um, I was angry. I mean, thinking back to nineteen ninety two, when the result I was not seventeen with the when the Rodney King verdict was was released, and I remember just feeling you know, I was stunned. I couldn't understand why. And I think that the narrative, um, now I'm in my 40s, so I'm thinking, okay, many of us parents are now having our youth in their 20s and we, we carry that with us, right? And so uh, this organizer, um, this volunteer, I should say, met in Baltimore with the chief and with the police commissioner and said, okay, you want... I want something better for my children. 
And both young men had the same goal, but the first outspoken young man did not strategize, right? They, they kept protesting, which, you know, we have our youth, they wanna be heard. I was that youth, I wanted to be heard, I was marching. But at the end of the day, I, I also came to a point that like, okay, what am I getting out of this? What am I getting out of just making protests? And I reached a moment in which I said, okay, this is not working. The changes are not happening the way I want them to. And thankfully I was able to, to find a, a venue by which change is slowly happening. Change takes time. And I, as a youth, want to change now, you know? And I think that it's fair for our youth to demand change now because we are, you know, 500 years worth of, of oppression, not just in our black community, but all these other communities that we have, our Asian communities, our Latino communities, our Native Americans that our voices at times. And we can continue using all these different examples from our, from our history. But at the end of the day, both young men learned that it's through the system that we are actually bring the change. And, and I wanna be able to facilitate through CAB means by which we can help our youth find their voice and bringing them to CAB as well, um, as well as being able to go to them. Because I think it's, it's also important that, that we honor their space and their feelings um, of like, like the way I felt back in 92 of feeling that void and, and not having answers and, and educating our youth about the pro appropriateness of their leadership in within the system yes be angry yes you know you have the right but here's how we can make a complaint a lot of our children a lot of our youth get angry but they don't know how to report something that happened right uh, normally what happens is that we call our community activists that we know everybody knows right hey this is what happened to me but we need to educate everyone on what is the proper way to making a report on what they perceive as police brutality or whatnot, because um, it's only through that way that we're gonna know what's going on. Uh, this weekend on Friday, if you recall, there was an article uh, that spoke about someone that did not make a report, that they felt that they had been stopped and harassed during the stop, but they never reported it. So nobody recorded it and so it didn't happen if we don't report it no one knows about it and the 70 cases that are currently in uh, cpp are part of the way that we are able to make that um, noted right uh, for example our unions are going to protect our workers right because that's what we should be doing as uh, unions do ensure that employers are following the law as far as discipline. But as a boss, I cannot discipline what I don't know is happening. And so I implore our, sorry, <laughs> our community to, to learn the ways by which we can um, exert our democratic response um, right, as well as how we educate our youth to be able to um, to protest in ways that they themselves are not going to get damaged. Because the last thing I want as an educator, as a community leader, is that more of our young men and young women that don't know another way by which they can express their feelings, by which they can get answers, by which they can feel that there's justice. Um, it's our, our responsibility as their mentors to, to guide them and provide the space for them to, to voice. So um, one of the things that we wanna do from now until the next meeting is, is possibly like a, um, a meeting or a panel um, where we're gonna be talking a little bit more. Um, we wanna get into understanding more of the ordinance that was presented to the city this last council meeting. Um, which is my chair report, uh, the second item. Um, 
this last Tuesday, wait, not this Tuesday, a week ago, yes, last week, the city council had campaign zero come and speak on the concerns of the continued uh, pretext stops and the data that reflects that there's that disparity, right? That there's still continued um, excess of stops with certain people in our community versus others. And the disparity often is about people's color. And so the, I went as cab and I presented our recommendation that we gave three years ago. It was in April of 2018, if I remember correctly, where we presented our recommendations. Was it two years ago? I don't recall. At the time we gave, if you recall, it was it's a pillar number two, 2.22, um, to have a moratorium. Oh, thank you, Samantha. Samantha's correcting me, 2019. Um, and being able to have um, the, the city council understand that, hey, we made this recommendation two years ago and it wasn't taken seriously. So because of that, we're now facing these other challenges. And I, I did have a conversation this morning uh, with Mr. Brown to discuss um, the, the purpose of CAB. Does CAB have uh, a purpose in the city? What is, uh, especially with the recommendations from our mayor, uh, that CAB and CPP were not consulted. And, and I understand the urgency to make those changes. But I think that if we're not gonna honor the, the recommendations that the city board with the, the community input provided, um, then why are we here, right? And so uh, it was, reiterated that yes, our voice is uh, important and that we are gonna continue um, meeting as CAB and being able to increase the, the importance of having community voice coming to CAB. Um, I was hoping to be able to have our leaders uh, from the community come and speak on the protect ordinance uh, with a short notice, they were not able to do so, but we would like to, to get the members um, from CPAP to be able to, to co-present and inform our, our community what this, is in, this ordinance entails so that we can find a way to respond to the community's uh, concerns. So um, I wanted to bring back to the, to, the, to the board the fact that I did present uh, I did speak on behalf of CAB and I met with my executive team prior to, and I, and I said, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go speak on, on behalf of CAB. I could not make other further recommendations, but to just go present to city council, this is what CAB did two years ago and it wasn't heard. So hopefully now we can move forward with that. Um, prior to that, I do wanna report that we also met uh, myself and Reverend Brown with council member Raul Campillo from district seven to express our, our concerns and, and get his input as well as to how we can improve the community relations in, in within his district. Um, and, and he also talked about the concerns that within um, Linda Vista and the other areas within the district and how they do see the disparity in policing practices uh, that have been expressed to him and his staff by community members. Um, so we're gonna continue working with that. He did say that if we had any candidates that can represent District 7 to please let him know. Um, and so the, do you recall anything else, Reverend? It's been so long that we met that I, don't recall what other details um, came about our meeting, but basically that they, they were supportive of CAB and they're gonna continue working with us. One of the real, uh, Madam Chair, one of the real things that, that, that uh, 
with everything that you've said thus far is that uh, we talked with the council member and his staff about making sure that we have representation from, from his district. Uh, as I said before, uh, um, that again, we, we had someone from his district that is still on the board uh, because we haven't had a nomination from from District Seven, and so um, in our conversation with with uh, with Matthews Gordon, Director Gordon, this morning, as well as the mayor's uh, person, uh, Matthews uh, Yazabek, I think it is that they will look into making sure that there is a representative from that district that will, in fact, speak up for that district and take the information back, um, and that's uh, of course was one of the challenges that we had uh, with the with the seventh district. We also, uh, from, from their meeting, so he gave us uh, his assurance that he would do that. And uh, the council member is also, as you may know, a former city attorney. And so he's, uh, he's right there in the middle looking at both sides as it relates to police and community relations. And he wants to make sure, again, that the community has a voice. And so that was the kind of crux of the conversation that we had. Okay. Yeah, I do recall him saying that there was that disparity within the district and his own experience. Thank you for elaborating on that, Reverend. You're welcome. And the last item that I wanted to, to share, actually there's two more items. Um, the first one is the, as I mentioned before, the mayor's release of policing priorities. Um, it took me by surprise. Um, and, and I think, like I was mentioning a minute ago, it's that, uh, that urgency of the mayor's office to try to address some of the community concerns that have been also brought to him. Um, and so hopefully we can continue working through CPP and CAB, uh, to, with the community as well, to bring those initiatives forward so that our, our community feels that they are being heard. Because I think that it's it's often believed that, you know, we go and we say, and, and then nothing gets done. And, and that's been frustration that that even we CAB members have had. So um, the, the, the staff agreed that they need to, to be more cognizant of the systems that, that we do currently have, how this board was created to to have that community voice as well to um, and express it, including the community concerns that we have been addressing during our board meetings uh, and that we're gonna be having another concern today brought up from one of our districts. Um, so as we move forward, we wanna continue building that, um, I guess, that I don't wanna say task force, but that community understanding both ways that we need to, to to find a plausible solution to the anger that is being felt in our community because of those disparities, All right? Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to, I think that's it. Yes, and that, the meeting that we had this morning with um, Mr. Gordon from, from the mayor's office, which I'm not sure why he wasn't able to make it this evening, uh, but he was gonna come and speak to, to Cab about, um, the report itself and, and what is that, how are we gonna move forward with, with um, the, the mayor's priorities report that he released, I believe it was a week ago. Um, that's my report. Any questions? I just had a question process wise on, for these meetings with um, we've got some comments in the chat from folks in the audience. Oh, okay. In response, um, Chair, to your, uh, to your remarks. And I just wanted to see, are we, um, are, are folks able to be and to, yeah. speak, to speak to your comments? So I think it looks like Tasha and, and Dahlia both have made comments. Sure. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is the community's board. So, so if we can uh, open up to our panelists, because we do want to hear from the community. This is Tasha, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Hi, thank Tasha. you for, hi, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think that it is, um, 
is uh, biased and disrespectful um, to talk about uh, a group of individuals um, who have not been um, heard um, and have been silenced, um, who have been brutalized uh, by uh, local law enforcement. Um, and who, unlike yourselves, um, do not feel comfortable sitting down with law enforcement who have lied and brutalized them um, and refuse to change um, a lot of the things in their systems uh, that are um, disproportionately impacting people um, of color. And so I think that when uh, you say things like that, it is a misrepresentation. I too went through uh, the riots of Rodney King. I was actually in the location where they were rioting. Um, I was nine, eight months pregnant during that time. Um, so there was fires all around me. So I know what it's like when people are outraged and angry like they are tonight with the release of Angel Hernandez's murder that is going to go uncharged as other officers within SDPD who have murdered um, people negligently have not received charges. Like we have officers who are criminals that have records that are still law enforcement officers. Um, so the same type of accountability uh, that we seek for them and that they get from us when they arrest us, it's not equal, it's not equitable, it's not there. And so I think that protests need to happen and I think that people need to sit at the tables with them. Um, and I think that people who sit at the tables with them should not be disrespectful of people who protest them uh, because both of us are needed. Um, I don't realize or haven't realized that you guys have um, made uh, some of the changes that protesting has made. And also we haven't made some of the changes that you all have made, but I'm not disrespectful to it. Um, so I would just ask that, that we think about the things that we're saying and how we're saying that and, and representing ourselves um, when we're saying it. Uh, also, when it comes to CPAT, um, CPAT is definitely not going to come to this meeting. I don't believe, and I'm a member, um, to talk about an ordinance in detail with police sitting at the table. Um, police do not fight uh, fair, um, especially not the POA, when they uh, do not approve something. Um, so this is not something that I think that uh, CPAT would do um, in front of police. Uh, so, <laughs> and, and police know what I'm talking about because there's been many other times where there's things that have been pushed and they have been against and how they fought it. Um, the mayor has absolute power to push more than a letter um, that has very little details and a no timeline. Um, and so for me, uh, this is um, not something that I would want um, a mayor with all the power that Todd Gloria has uh, to be doing. Todd Gloria can push emergency ordinances um, to stop some of the stuff that SDPD is doing in our community. Thank you very much, Tasha, for, for joining us today. And, and more than anything, thank you for being willing to, to speak because that's another voice that we need to, to hear about. And the reason that we have begun to create a space in our agenda for uh, community organizations is precisely for this, to be able to have that voice. Because when CAB initi initiated, we did have a lot of community voices coming and sharing their experiences. And because of COVID, because for whatever reason, for um, the belief of CAB, um, not moving initiatives fast enough, uh, that, that stopped. And so I, I appreciate you coming in and, and providing us your input. My question is, how then do we move forward? How, how can we, and that's always been my my concern like okay so and i get it you know people some rest like you said and, and I, I didn't mean to disrespect you in any way i, yeah, I was protest my and perspective. Arrest is different things so don't don't combine the two i'm sorry say protest that again and, protest and unrest are two different things um when i protest yeah. i'm not i don't have unrest i'm not rioting i'm not looting i'm not doing any of that my protests and many other people's protests have been very peaceful um, and so when you talk about protest um, in the manner that you did, it's, it comes off as disrespectful. 
Um, and what and when you're saying, how do we move forward? I don't understand how we don't move forward. I mean, we're training people how to actually file complaints. Um, we're actually training people how to film police when they stop. Um, we're actually training people about the policies of police. Um, we're training people how to uh, actually contact um, 911 and what to say when there's a 5150 so that they won't be killed by police. So we understand say, about PERT. And so we're helping said, communities to understand that. Sorry about the, um, the interruption. When you say we, are you talking about CPAT? I'm talking about a group of organizations, myself as well. Um, there are a number of organizations out there that are doing that. Um, okay. So that's what I'm talking about. And they also protest police. No, and, and yes, you're absolutely right. There is a clear distinction between a protest where people are expressing, like you said, and the unrest, which, and that was my point, I guess, and it wasn't clear enough that, that oftentimes we do have the, um, the protesters that are doing their constitutional right and being able to express, and they should have that platform. And I think that, that I remember that when I was co-chair, we had uh, in Ferguson, there were the, the people that were coming from the out of the community of the city coming in and trying to stir the pot. Th those are the ones I'm talking to talk about that the, the, sometimes our youth may not always have the proper ways by which they can manifest their their right to protest, um, and I applaud the fact that we are, that you are educating the youth because I think that that has been um, my concern, my norma concern, that oftentimes our, our children don't have the 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 knowledge of how to be able to exercise their rights without resulting in in an arrest. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Madam um, Chair. Yes, go ahead, Samantha. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to uh, thank Tasha Williamson for, for joining us this evening to uh, be a voice of the community in a, a number of capacities in which she serves. Um, we, we appreciate your presence. Um, I would like to say that as, as a board, we are in no way trying to mischaracterize the, the value of, of protest and the place that it serves in advancing numerous civil rights issues and the agendas and concerns of marginalized communities. Um, we know that these are issues that need a voice in San Diego. And so we, we very much um, appreciate organizations that are doing the work to um, advocate for and empower others to advocate for themselves. So, um, you know, please don't assume that we are mischaracterizing the value of protest. Um, you know, the, the purpose of this board is, as, as I said earlier, is to definitely create that position and opportunity for engagement between um, SDPD and, and the community. And we have to be honest with ourselves in saying that occasionally those engagements are gonna be uncomfortable, but they are necessary. And so, you know, we need all parties to be at the table in a very, um, you know, genuine and authentic uh, intention of, of hearing each other and advancing the conversation. Um, Ms. Williamson, I, I recognize that you, as well as many other ad activists in the community, have had a long and, and challenged relationship, you know, with SDPD. And as we, as a board, look to, you know, revitalizing our role within the community, um, we want to be that that middle ground, that liaison, and that bridge um, between the two parties. Um, I did have the opportunity today to speak with. Uh, someone who serves on the board of the ACLU here in San Diego and who also um, serves in CPAT. And I was informed that the actual language of the ordinance is not going to be prepared for release until at least next week, at which point we will hopefully be able to secure a, a speaker from CPAT to come and, and present the, um, the technical language of the ordinance to the community next month. Um, I recognize, as I said, that these relationships have been strained, um, but we really wanna, wanna press forward in creating new dialogues and new opportunity 
for engagement. So, you know, please work with us to, to advance that effort because we can only do that through continuing to, to stay engaged with each other. That's all I'd like to say at this time. Norma, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, you're absolutely right, um, Samantha, and, and I do honor Ms. Williamson's voice to come in. Uh, and that's exactly what we need, right? We need to be able to be the conduit, like um, Samantha said, that there are gonna be people that are not comfortable in coming to the table. And we recognize that. And so I, I was actually talking to, was I'm not sure if it was Reverend, today or who it was that we have to be able to go also be willing to go to where folks are at and some folks like you said tasha don't don't believe in the system and so i'm at the point that okay then what can we do from the polar opposites to to find a medium way and at the end of the day i think we all have the same goal is to have a safer city for everyone and I hope for that with that in mind, we can sit down and, and share knowledge because there's a lot of things like you said, and, and I'll be the first one to say, I don't have the voice for everyone. I don't, uh, I can't speak for everyone. And so that's why it's important to, to have those dialogues so that I can better understand uh, everyone that does not want to come to the table and the challenges that, that um, I have because I don't have that that perspective. And so hopefully we can sit down and, and, and I can learn from that to better find ways in our board or in the community to, to resolve them. Madam uh, Chair, Ms. Palmier has yeah, her hand I was going to say, I, I see that Ms. Dahlia has her hand. Go ahead, Ms. Um, Palmier. Hi, you can just call me Dahlia. No, I just wanted to say um, thank you for the invitation. And um, I'm also part of the SDPD um, African American Chief Advisory Board, uh, where we, um, oh, right, it's a relatively new board, so we're really defining what our role is going to be. But I believe it's for the most part is just providing some, yeah, what you're doing here, um, advising to the chief on um, some of the things that we're seeing from a county perspective. I 100% agree with what um, Tasha is Williamson is stating, and. We do, I just, you know, I live in North County, um, um, very much an advocate for what's happening in the city of San Diego. Um, and just sitting back and looking, I just see, aside of the efforts from Tasha and many um, grassroots organizations who are out there protesting and making, you know, uplifting the voices of folks in the neighborhoods that are um, direct targets, um, of the of SDPD, it pains me to even say that, um, but it's true. I don't see a lot of um, crossing the aisle from the SDPD, and I'm hoping that that can change. So maybe that is something. I know that's something we talked about on our advisory board, uh, but I would love to see that in this advisory board. Um, there's much. In, I know I heard you asking um, Norma about like you know how, what do we need to do. I just feel like that question keeps getting asked, but nothing's happening. Like, I think it just needs to be done. There's much information out there. There's clear, people are clearly stating loudly, this is what we need as a community. So I don't know why we're asking. I think we need to listen, like actively listen to what communities that are being, um, disproportionately impacted by police brutality and over policing. I mean, it's clear as day. I live in Rancho Penasquitos, trust and believe. I barely see the cops around here and I know why. So there's a very clear difference. So as an advisory board, I would recommend that we move beyond the, what can we do to look at what we've been told that we can do and, and the police department, you know, 
I just think we need to start listening and being different. And you know what? Setting aside our biases and the ego, because the ego is very much at play here. And like I said, I just stand back and I watch. I don't live in the city of San Diego, but I see what's happening. And there's a lot of ego and it's coming out of the police department, quite honestly, and a lot of talk. And I don't see a lot of anything. So let's support, if we're really about humanity, let us truly support the people who need our help. And let's listen to them. Because otherwise, we're just going to keep talking and nothing's going to happen. So I just want to state that respectfully. And I would actually love to some, maybe um, I would, um, we have a, a board coming up with the chief coming up real quick here, but I would love for the two of us, the, this, these two boards, um, to get together with an all African American advisory board and hear some voices. Because I'm just, you know, maybe that's an opportunity for us to partner. But Absolutely. The, yeah. But the talking, I think we're done with talking and asking questions. We just gotta, we gotta make, you know what? We know what the problem is. We just need to start taking steps to be human. That's, that's what I feel. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dahlia. And, and absolutely, we would um, love to be able to, to partner up and, and, uh, and hear, like you said, that's absolutely crucial for us to listen um, and be able to have um, the community voice come and and like you said like I said a minute ago with to Tasha's point that when people don't want to come to us we need to be able to go to others comfortable place of to be able to share the the stories and that we can then use to to move the work that we have proposed the 33 recommendations that we have made a lot of them um, like you said have been based on practices that other cities and 21st century policing best practices for community relations to improve. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done. And actually in our agenda, we do have a, a follow-up in the work plan to discuss the recommendations that we had made. Actually, that's the next, no, no, it's not the next part. Sorry, the next part is hey, addressing- you know, you somebody, uh, Dahlia wanted to, she had another comment. Okay, agenda. go ahead, Ms. Dahlia. Well, Sorry, I was looking you. at the agenda. Thank you. Um, I think I, I also would recommend that we have to ask ourselves, why is change not happening fast enough? It's interesting that when the city wants something done or the county wants something done, we see how quickly things can get done. Here you have um, communities of people who are um, I don't even know what the word is. I, I can't even, I can't even say what the word is because sometimes I, I think that there's just no words of what's happening, the, the disproportionality. So I, I challenge all of us to ask the question, why is this not happening? Why aren't we making changing changes? Because if we really are invested and we really care about communities of people, it's a no brainer. And we just move, we move forward and we do it. You know, I'm not gonna, I will, I will like, just think about, I mean, I see advocacy for children all the time. I see advocacy for, for pets more so than communities of people who are being like targeted just for walking the street. Now I'm not gonna say that there isn't any problems that's everywhere, but this is above and beyond, um, just somebody doing wrong in the street. This is something crossing into skin color, racism, you know, all of those things. I mean, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but why, why is it taking so long? Why is the police department not banding together and, and meeting not even halfway? I think you need to cross that line over more than halfway because it's definitely disproportionate. I mean, if you are constantly being targeted you know, the fear, the, the, the anger, then you just start to do things that are destructive, the trauma, the emotional, psychological. I mean, all these things, and this is generational, and this is the problem that's been happening. I'm a transplant, so I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. I've lived here for 16 years, but this is definitely a case of the reason why things are the way they are today is because of the collective trauma to of you know, groups of people who just want to have access and opportunity and just be left alone. I've heard stories of, you know, kids 
you know, hanging out in their own neighborhoods and being harassed by cops. Like, when is that going to stop? And I'm not saying all cops are, you know, horrible. That's not the case. But like, I'm asking the cops who, who see this happening to band or to, you know, to check their peers. I, I don't, what's it going to take? And I think that we have an opportunity right now to do what's, what's right and create a different type of city. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dahlia, uh, for your comments and your participation. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think what we've learned here tonight um, via both the comments of, of Ms. Williamson and Ms. Balmier is that there are definitely opportunities that we need to take up in um, going to people where they are as opposed to assuming that they're going to be comfortable in coming to us in this forum. And I, I know as we move out of um, a lot of the heavy COVID restrictions that we've been under for the past year, that those opportunities are going to be afforded to us um, more readily. And, um, you know, I know that um, one of the things that we've discussed as a board um, that the community may not be aware of is that we are definitely concerned about creating greater opportunities for, for dialogue with the community directly so that we can be um, you know, fully informed advocates on, on their behalf. And so we'll be definitely in touch with um, anyone who, who wants to, to speak to us about their issues and concerns. And um, we want to create an avenue for for this space to be a safe space, and if if they're not comfortable here, to um, you know have some meetings in, in different settings, and then at least bring the information back and convey it because um, we we can't continue to exist um, within a paradigm of there's nothing that can be done. We can't engage, and we can't really move forward. Um, there are far too many systematic issues in place for that to be our attitude moving forward. And so, you know, we are, we are fully committed to the work. We have had conversations with the mayor's office, as our chair has stated, that says they are committed to us remaining in place and continuing to do this work. And so, you know, this is, this is where we're going. This is the direction it needs to be in, and, and we're happy to do it. So I really want to thank you all for, for joining us th this evening. Yeah, I echo what Ms. Jenkins said. Uh, we actually, um, when I took us chair, we, CAB wanted to go to the actual organizations. And I remember telling, um, I don't recall if it was the whole board or, or just my executive team. I said, you know, we need to be able, we continue to have the meetings in city sponsored locations, libraries um rec centers and we're not going to schools where the children are to get the youth voice we're not going to churches uh we're not going to locations where the community calls the shots you know um some of our best meetings as cab have been at churches um i remember miss fisher and our board um always echoes the fact that when we went to pastor sandoval's church and cab was just listening we really didn't do much more agenda items than, you know, our minutes and um, just sharing board reports, but it was really the community speaking about their experiences. Those were some of the most powerful meetings and we want that. That's what CAB should be about. And that is the reason that we have that community segment where the community concerns are, are taken. And, and Dalia and Tasha, if we need to be the ones that we connect individually separately and then we bring the, the concerns to the table we'll do that because i think it's it's important for us to to do that I, I i will never speak on anyone's behalf but i think that if there's a concern that that you entrust cab to to address like today we're going to be addressing one of the concerns that was brought to us um, regarding the southeastern division racial connotations um, I don't have background on it, so I'm just going to uh, allow the 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 discussion of of, in, of educating us what that's about and and what else we can do to um, to resolve it or to look for solutions uh, to improve the community relations in Southeastern Division. Um, 
So I, I again, I appreciate you both coming in and speaking uh, because it's easy to just not say anything and walk away, but your, your courage to say something is one that I, I honor and I appreciate. So thank you and we hope to we can continue working um, forward now. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so the next item in, so yeah, campaign zero, we're, uh, we're not gonna be discussing that um, as I just mentioned. So just board members know that that's something that the community is, is um, feeling that they wanna bring that to city council to be able to, to pass as, as an ordinance, okay. Madam Chair, I do have some information that I can share if you're comfortable with doing that at this time, or do sure. you want to? No, please. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. So um, there is an organization um, that Ms. Williamson referred to that she's a member of the Coalition for Police Accountability and Transparency. It's a coalition that is comprised of a number of organizations in our community that are doing work around police reform um, and uh, racial and social justice issues, um, the ACLU being one of them um, and among others. And so they have uh, put forth this initiative um, that's called PROTECT and it stands for presenting, I'm sorry, preventing over policing through equitable community treatment. Um, as I said earlier, the official language of the ordinance has not been finalized yet, but they have put out into the community um, a talking points uh, sheet that uh, were, was distributed to members of the community so that they could speak to the issue during last week's the ordinance will be the following. I'm just going to read it directly from the material that they put out. And it is essentially um, that the ordinance will require officers to have a probable cause to stop or detain anyone. This includes fourth waivers um, who, are, who are on parole and have waived some of their Fourth Amendment rights. Um, it will require probable cause for searches. It will prohibit officers from questioning people about any offenses beyond the offense for which they were stopped unless the officers have probable cause and it will seek to hold officers accountable if they violate the ordinance. So um, that is what the general content of the ordinance uh, will be. And um, these proposed items are um, crafted in response to the findings of numerous studies in recent years on uh, disparate policing and policing practices in San Diego, particularly um, as they apply to communities of color. So that's kind of a general overview of, of what this initiative is. And um, you can check it out on uh, Facebook. You can look up Protect. You can go to the ACLU, San Diego um, and Imperial County's ACLU uh, web page and and find uh, this information as well. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. And just to add to that, there were over 30 speakers last Tuesday that uh, came and spoke uh, on behalf and, and in favor of Protect. Uh, so it's something that that board members in this and CAP should, should be aware of and, and be following. Um, okay, so the next item on our, on our agenda are the community concerns specifically to the Southeastern Division. Uh, is Ms. Williamson, I see that your comments on chat, are you presenting on that? Okay, yes, go ahead. I was Ms. asked to come and present. Uh, we've been protesting for uh, six, six weeks now. Um, I think this week will be our seventh week. Um, on uh, February 21st, Officer Sullivan and Officer Bilotti um, around 10 o'clock a.m. at the Four Corners of Life, um, if for people who don't know, is Euclid and Imperial, uh, stopped uh, Mr. Glennie uh, Martin, a 73-year-old wheelchair-bound man who was Black, and a white man who we do not know his name um, because they let the white man go. And they stopped Mr. Glennie Martin um, and decided to ticket him. Uh, a woman uh, from the community, black woman walked up, said, um, why are you citing a black man and you let the white man go? 
um, for uh, jaywalking. And uh, one of the officers said, you know, you're right. So he looked in the, the cart of uh, Mr. Martin and said, I'm just gonna cite him for this open container. So Mr. Martin Glenny, um, who is low income, was cited uh, for having an open container in his wheelchair basket. Um, we asked for the release of the video um, because we believe that that video would be very damning to SDPD and that they should make it public um, to, the, to the greater community uh, of what these officers did. They have refused um, and uh, we filed complaints. Um, on March 17th, Officer Summers and Officer Page um, stopped uh, their vehicle in front of a car accident that had just happened and got out of the vehicle, um, parked the car, got out of the vehicle and walked past the car accident up to uh, the Chevron gas station on 47th um, and Imperial and uh, grabbed the arms of a black man, uh, Mr. Perry Owens Jr. Um, who is also the nephew of Troy Owen Sr., who is a retired Southeastern police officer, and grabbed him. He said, what are you doing? They said, you look like you have a warrant. Um, he said, I don't have any warrants. I can go, I can give you my, you know, I can go in my pocket and get my wallet, uh, and you can see that it's not me. Um, they said, no. Um, the officer, Officer Simmers, the female officer, went into his back pocket, pulled out his wallet, pulled out his ID, said, oh, it's not you, have a nice day. Um, he said, no, you can't just do me like this. You need to call a sergeant. So a sergeant was called. Um, he went Facebook Live and Musla showed up. Musla is also part of the Southeast San Diego Accountability Unit. Um, they stop whenever they see police officers stop and they record. Um, they get the names and ID numbers of the officers, um, especially those officers who are reckless and rogue and disrespectful in Southeastern community. Um, so we found out uh, and we protested Southeastern Division, myself and others. Um, and Captain Manny Del Toro came outside during one of the protests, actually during two of the protests, um, and began to talk about the victims um, of these officers' racial profiling. And he began to say that Perry Owens was a gang member. Have you seen his Facebook page? Have you looked at his, his lyrics um, of his music? Uh, he said, you know, he's a bad actor. He's not a good community member. Um, and then I found out about allegedly Manny Del Toro's background and how he should not talk about anyone else's background and neither should any of these other officers that aren't paying attention today. Because Manny Del Toro allegedly was demoted as a detective to now become a captain after he reportedly and allegedly told, gave information about police raids. And so we're asking the police department to be transparent like their chief says, to be open like their chief says to allow even the your boards, why can't you review the body-worn camera footage of what we're talking about? If you're an advisory board, if they respect you so much, why can't you come to the community and say, we saw this, we're talking to them, we're meeting with them, we're trying to figure this out, but they don't even do that with you. So this police department has been disrespectful. Then as we are protesting our about fourth or fifth week, we find out that Officer Aaron Sultan, who is an officer at Southeastern Division, and that this had been hidden from the community, had allegedly said in front of other officers, I hate niggas. And that an officer turned him in, filed a complaint, and that it was his word against Aaron Sultan's word, and that they were going to return him back to Southeastern. And we began to protest Officer Aaron Sultan. Return him if you want to. This is the disrespect that we are talking about. You wanna know why we protest? We protest because they are disingenuous, because they protect them. Who protects us? Not CAB, not CPP, not the chiefs. So 
So we will continue to protest. We were told uh, not too long ago uh, that the plans for SDPD, at least the plans for Captain Manny Del Toro is to arrest us on Thursday or to attempt. Last Thursday, he used his car to brush up against protesters. Um, this is the captain of Southeastern Division. We, I have filed complaints. I have filed complaints. He is trying to incite something that SDPD will not be able to get around. His officers have said they should have run us, run us over. So these officers that sit at your table, they know. And if they don't, they know now. So I dare one officer to run over our protesters. I dare one officer to hurt our people because we are no longer going to stand around and watch you kill us like you have been doing. Today, I witnessed a video of Angel Hernandez for six minutes and seven seconds have a knee on his neck and the weight of a grown man on his chest and another weight of a grown man on his back. And you know what they had to say? Is that they got their training and use of force from SDPD. I've never seen one training that put a knee on the neck, not one. And they held this video for well over a year, well over a year. So I'm done talking to the police. I'm done sitting at the table with the police. Me and Mr. Jordan, we have had words on social media because he is allowed to be reckless and he sits at your table. He has been disrespectful to our community. It is disrespectful when these people can come into our communities and be disrespectful and have no consequences and no accountability. So if you are a cab, I need you to step your game up because these officers is real reckless in Southeast where black and brown lives and Asian Pacific Islander lives are at risk, immigrant lives. Ms. Williamson, uh, the protests, are they in the division? Are they at the- they, we, we are on SICAR or SICAR and uh, uh, Skyline Drive. The address is 7222 Skyline Drive and we block their entrance um, and, and they can go around. So the issue is, is that we've blocked an entrance. They have three entrances to get into their building. They want to take the short entrance. Well, well, my attitude is, is that you could take the long entrance because your officers took shortcuts to stop people. So if arrest is what they want to do, go ahead. You can arrest 10, 20 of us. It'll be 20 more of us. It will grow because it is growing. People are tired. They are tired of the police and how they treat us. They can grab us, they can touch us, they can do whatever, slam us, they can do whatever they wanna do. And Jack Schaefer will protect them with his police officers union. We're tired. And what we won't do is we will no longer stand while they kill us and use excessive force and we watch. So we are training our community to be able to defend itself from reckless and lawless police officers. They will have to deal with us one way or another. We can be peaceful, but you will not slaughter us like we are animals. That is what they have done and continue to do. And they laugh and joke and think it's funny. There were white officers that also, I believe, heard Aaron Sultan when he said those words. And they took the blue coat of silence. One officer stood up. And we know for a fact that other officers who have stood up in Southeastern and other areas have been retaliated against in this department, by this department. So if this department is really serious about the duty to intervene, then they should not be retaliating. They should not tolerate retaliation against officers who step up. Thank you, Tasha. Um, and, and I appreciate you bringing this because I had no idea this was going on and, and I am embarrassed by the fact that I don't. Um, I too live in, East, South, uh, in Southeastern and um, I have no words except to say that I, now that I do know, uh, I, I do want to learn more about this. Um, I don't Tell know- Tell them to release the video. You want to learn more? If it's not the truth, tell them to release the video. Tell them to let you watch the video. You are the chair of CAB. 
tell them to show you the videos. Don't use Pobar. Don't use the police officers, nothing. They can show you the video. Okay. I'm tired. I'm tired of Pobar and this and that. And you want to talk about transparency and openness and you closed and hide and stuff and tell going around in departments and telling them, please don't speak to the public. Shame on you. Shame on all of you. These officers know what I'm talking about. I don't know if Chief Shiloh or Captain Jordan have anything to, to say to this. Yeah, I know we're, um, we're aware and looking into the complaints that are, that are coming out of Southeastern. And I know um, Chief Neslight confirmed he'll be on the next meeting. So we'll defer to him to address it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Del Toro wasn't there before. Is, is he new to the division? I, I didn't understand. Are you asking, we, sorry, a little bit of a hearing problem. Are you asking how long Captain Del Toro has been the commanding officer of Southeastern Division? Yes. Um, about the, six months. Yeah, it's been, I would say over about six months or, or longer. Okay, because he wasn't he, there. Division, yeah, he, he was transferred from Southern Division, mm -hmm. Southeastern. The I remember. Gary Hara. Yes. And I remember there was a positive relationship with the community and, and there's a lot of before. And so that's why I was shocked to, to first hear about this when it was presented. And they're like, do you really wanna move this? I'm like, yes, if this is what the community wants to talk about. We absolutely need to put it on the agenda. Um, so so Ms. Williamson, I, I, I give you my word. I personally will be reaching out and, and asking for the footage and um, and following up on, on this complaint to, to ensure that it is fully investigated. And we are also aware that some of these officers have sustained findings um, of uh, similar incidents. Um, and then I'm also concerned with the fact that I filed a complaint um, last year. Um, and uh, the way the complaint process has been is that you don't find out about the complaints until a year later when they send you a letter. Um, after that year, there's nothing that can be done to police officers. So we believe that their system um, is actually um, helping rogue and reckless officers because there's nothing we can do to go back and make changes um, when we receive um, a letter a year later um, saying that these are the findings. Um, we can't amend the finding, amend the uh, complaint. We can't do anything because a year has passed. And according to Pobar, after a year, there is nothing that can be done um, to that officer or officers. Um, not to mention that I have a complaint from last year where um, SDPD internal affairs said that it was okay for officers to pistol whip someone to subdue them. Um, that they said that it was okay for officers to repeatedly strike someone who is subdued, handcuffed, um, and unconscious with no weapon near them. Um, that is case number 20180712. It is in writing that SDPD is okay with this. And you want me to sit at the table with them? That's a coward. And the fact that they have said that these officers were not drunk and I have receipts from McGregor's bar that says they had 24 drinks between four officers in less than 20 minutes and they were not they did not drive home by themselves after the cops came. Come on now, don't play these games with me. And the police department is playing games with us. So we're going to continue to protest them. We're going to continue to do what we do because we want them out. You have officers who are lying on reports for new cases. And we are getting those cases and finding that there are lies. The cases do not reflect the body-worn camera footage. This is the SDPD you sit at the table with. I don't want to hear that somebody is looking into the case and a chief. You a chief. You a chief. They parade you around as a black chief with no power. I'm tired of our black people being disrespected. I'm tired. I'm tired of our black people sitting around doing nothing for black people or any people. And so if I shame you, it's because I'm ashamed of you. 
Well, go ahead, Jenkins. Jenkins. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Ms. Williamson for, for coming and sharing these concerns with us this evening. Um, you know, I represent District 4 on this board, and I was hearing about these protests, um, these issues in the community. And as someone who, who sits on this board, who lives in this community, um, who has a vested interest as an African-American person, um, I felt that it, it needed um, open air and um, so that we could move some action um, forward. So what I would like to know, and this is a question I've been asking for a while, I know that we've been in COVID for a year um, and dealing with the, the restrictions on gatherings as a result of that, but, um, we've also learned over the, the span of that year that we are very able to hold virtual meetings such as this. I would like to know at what point does the, the new captain for the Southeastern Division plan to have a meeting with the community members who have these concerns? Um, and I would like to be present at, at that meeting. Um, to my knowledge, one of those meetings has not occurred since he came into his position. And as I said, there's no real excuse for that given the fact that we can have virtual meetings. So can um, Officer Jordan or, um, I'm sorry, I don't know the other gentleman's name, uh, speak to that? Yeah, you know, I can speak to it because I was actually was captain of Southeastern for, for about a year. So there's a captain's advisory board that normally will meet like monthly. So I know with COVID, just like you said, I know the in-person meetings have been kind of halted, but as, as we open up, I'm sure that Manny will have his chief advisory board monthly where community members will be able to come and kind of voice their concerns. So, and I'll make sure that I um, kind of um, talk to Manny and let him know to once, you know, things open up for him to, to have those. Well, I, it seems to me that, as I said, I've been asking this question for a number of months now, as I've had engagements with our um, you know, community services officer in, in the Southeastern Skyline Paradise Hills area in particular. And um, he hasn't been able to provide me any answers. And there's absolutely no reason that the tension should be continuing to rise in our community when, um, you know, we might be able to mitigate some of these issues by, you know, having some conversations. So I would like to know what concrete action can be taken beyond I'm going to talk to him and hopefully soon we'll get something on the books. You know, if this board is going to exist as an intermediary between the community and the police department, then you know, we have to believe that the police department is going to respond to us in, in timely course when concerns arise instead of letting things fester. So um, can he join us next month? And can we have a conversation with him prior to that to get this meeting orchestrated? Yeah, very soon. yeah, no, for sure. I will talk to Manny tomorrow and have him um, Look at his calendar, you know, especially when things are opening up and set up a date and get a hold of uh, tab with whoever community members want to attend. So I will do that tomorrow. Yeah, it, it sounds like it needs to be done real quick, Terrence, oh, especially yeah. listening to Tasha. And, and uh, this is the first I've heard all this, too. So we, we do need to jump on this like yesterday. Yeah. Especially if we want to build the trust of our community this is where it matters right this is where you know the things that that of the of the voiceless that they feel that no one's listening this is where it matters that we take action so um hopefully um not hopefully if we don't get a response right away then this will then become we, my own priority yeah, we don't here. want an ex we don't want it ex What's the word am I looking for? Exacerbate the problem yeah, beyond. Yeah, 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 yeah. We need to nip this in the bud real quick. Okay. Yeah, I don't want any incident to arise that's going to um, bring about bodily harm, any sort of violence, or any sort of mass arrest of members in our community who are, you know, executing their constitutional rights. Um, at the end of the day, the police department is is paid and sanctioned 
to protect and serve the community and not simply the interests of property owners and or the city. And we really need to get this addressed sooner rather than later. So I, I, I'm gonna say this as the District 4 representative, um, you know, as someone who also sits on the, the board for the Skyline Paradise Hills Planning Group, that this, this is long overdue to be addressed. I've been asking for months, when are the, the, the captain's roundtable meetings gonna reconvene? And we've gotta stop kicking this stuff down, the, you know, kicking the can down the street and acting like, you know, there doesn't need to be a time attached to these action items. So I will very much look forward to hearing tomorrow that we have something on the books. Right. Ms. Williamson, I'm going to reach out and um, I'd like to sit down with you to to learn more so I can get I can get the facts myself. Uh, I know you mentioned it today, uh, but I really want to make sure that I have all the facts that are, that are necessary to to provide our community the the answers that they seek um, in keeping our community safe. Yeah, and I want you to know that um, just last week, um, several uh, Latinx uh, youth um, were done the same way that Jerry Owens Jr. was. Uh, the gentleman's name is Esteban. Um, he was stopped by two white officers, a male and a female. Um, I just uh, filed a complaint for that one as well. Um, they asked the young men uh, who have nowhere to go to hang out except on their block. Um, were they on probation? Um, uh, you know, they were hanging out, you know, what are you doing? Are you on probation? Um, my simple thing is, is that, and Charlotte knows this, is that why not breed life into these kids that live into this community? They have all this around them. Why not ask them how they're doing? What, what can we do to get you a place that's safe? Why not do things like that? But instead, the kids said, this feels like racial profiling. Are you you want probation? Why are you asking us? Is we are we on probation? They get out of their vehicles. They walk up to Esteban, who is on probation, and they grab him. They take him down. They put handcuffs on him. They take him to the car, and they do a FI. This is how they treat us in Southeast. This is why we protest, because you sitting as a cab board had no knowledge, because they sitting in this meeting with you with knowledge. They didn't bring it up. They're supposed to be talking about the issues that are coming up in the communities, but they're not talking to you about it. You the advisory board that was created simply for this, but yet black and brown are treated in this way. So yeah, it's a lot of issues. And just like the FBI said, we know that white supremacists have infiltrated local law enforcement across this nation. And we believe that they have infiltrated our local law enforcement as well. And we believe that since Trump they, they have become very bold in how they act towards us. It is not gonna go well for them. So they should stop immediately. They should stop. Cause I am very peaceful. But when I have officers talking about they wish they could run me over, we should have ran her over. When I have officers talking in front of others about hurting me, I will not, I will not allow another officer to use excessive force on me. I will not, and neither will my community. So SDPD better get real real about how they wanna police because nobody is going to sit back and watch them brutalize us and kill us. Thank you, Ms. Williamson. Um, and, and we definitely will, will be acting on this. Thank you again for your Thank time. You for your courage, for your voice, um, we see you. So, so thank you again. Thank you, I need you to see them. Uh, I have another meeting I have to attend um, at 7.30. So I appreciate you guys' time, thank you. And I look forward to talking to you, Ms. Sandoval, um, at a later date. Um, we definitely need serious changes to happen and we need to have them, have, have them happen immediately because we are not. We are not going to continue to allow police to treat us in the manner that they have. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Okay, I'm going to move our agenda along. The next item on our agenda uh, was to review the first two pillars of our recommendations. I don't know if you guys have a copy of the um, our original recommendations from 2019, 
but I wanted to review these, uh, at least the first two pillars. I think we're not gonna be able to do the two. I think if anything, we could do maybe um, the first one to discuss where, where we are with those um, and to see what else needs to be happening. Because as, as our community has mentioned today, it's important for us to, to not just talk, right? It's, be able, it's important for us to, like Ms. Dahlia said, to act on those and um, what we said needs to be done. Uh, and so now with the new mayor posing these recommendations to uh, on police reform, we wanna go back and, and review what we made as a recommendation. And I think that it's um, as part of our work plan this year is to fine tune those 30 recommendations and see what we can move forward with um, to bring those those positive um, relationship building and, and progressive uh, steps that need to be done because the last thing that we need is to have the aftermath of the, the, the George Floyd uh, cases to, to taint San Diego in any way. Uh, so I have the, the document in the front of me. The first pillar is on building trust and legitimacy. Um, we have, I think, how many, one, we made one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 recommendations for pillar one. And this was sent, I don't know if you have your emails available, but on June, April, no, June 1st, 2020. Uh, wait, that's, that was to me. We passed them on April, 2019. And I wanted to make sure that we again revisit them. I know that Polly and, and the ad hoc committee did a really great job with training. Um, so Madam Chair, I'm familiar with all 30 recommendations. I know that in the past meeting you brought up 10 or 11, you asked for a written comment on those. I am prepared to discuss. Oh. And why don't you just okay? Let's go. Well, let's start with first the first pillar. So, can you move it to the very top, Gerald? This one point oh one that you have there is that the one you have? No, I'm, the community I'm, residents involved in the selection of candidates of the respective division uh, with the promotions that chief mentioned earlier in the meeting today. Has there been any engagement? I know that I participated in the panel uh, for the captains that are going to be considered coming up. Uh, but within that, have you considered or is there a, an action step towards getting the community residents to be part of that panel on the candidates for their respective division? I guess my first question is, is this one of the items that we already provided a written response, one of the 10? I, I don't recall, to be honest. So before I would comment, I know that you had identified 10 and I'm not sure which one of the 10 have all been responded to. I'd have to go back and look at the written responses that we've provided. Um, there, there was 30 and, um, but when we looked at this and we appreciate, I know you sat, sat on the captain's interview panel. That's a long week for the number of candidates that went before you. And obviously having that community uh, input and with you being there representing the community and sitting on the actual panels, I hope you had a good takeaway as to the questions and type of questions that we're asking and what the responses are from the various lieutenants who are captain's candidate. Obviously, when it gets into the selection of officers, um, the response I thought was pretty detailed. Is there something beyond this response that you were looking for? Because obviously a number of factors go into the placement of officers. For instance, when this next academy class graduates, we start with looking at what is the staffing level at each command. Some commands are fully staffed at 100%, other commands are not staffed. So there's a metrics that goes into how do we bring each command up respectively 
to staffing. Community concerns, how do they fit in within the community? What is that information? Obviously that's all passed along to the captain as to how those people performed. We also take into consideration a number of other factors in regards to where candidates live. For instance, um, when we're trying to retain people, we find that maybe people who live outside the county and they have an hour long commute, it's difficult for them to retain them if we're transferring them or putting them in a division that's uh, a pretty long travel. So we're taking into a number of different factors, but then we are, when the captain's advisory boards are in place, typically there's feedback about the types of candidates people want to see in their community. Obviously we're looking at a, a bunch of different metrics and trying to do what's best for the command, what's best for the community and what's best for the officer themselves and how they're placed. Particularly when someone speaks multiple languages and you have a community say like mid city and city heights when there's so many languages spoken, that's obviously a concern, making sure that we have people who can effectively communicate in multiple language is a consideration as well. So there's a number of factors that go into this that I think were outlined in the response. And I was hoping maybe you can be a little bit more specific with your question. So for example, in the case that we just heard, um, when Hara left and the Toro was placed there, was there any engagement in the community? Was the um, captain's um, review board in included or the um, the, the, the round table, captain's round table included in preparing the community, like, okay, uh, whether we had a, that informed them that he was moving on and how he was going to be uh, replaced by the Toro. Was there a process there in engaging the community? So are you asking, it, it just seems to be two different things here. I think there's one point is how are officers placed after they graduate the academy or how they transfer? Yeah. You're asking more specifically as to candidate how many officers candidate. may be selected or how they may be moved, uh, depending on the needs of the department. And so, you know, I know from the chief standpoint that, you know, we'd like to have stability whenever possible. I think Jerry Haar was at that command for a number of years. There was good relationships. Mm -hmm. um, but as the dynamic nature of the department evolves, um, obviously people with certain skill sets, Jerry Haar moved on to communications where he had been before because some of the challenges that we were having up there, we had a retirement um, with the captain who retired from communications and we needed somebody with expertise who could move into that position. So that was a considering factor. Um, I don't know if there's any other issues at place that we can discuss. Um, and as mentioned previously, Ms. Jenkins had brought up with COVID, obviously these kinds of meetings have not been taking place with the regularity that we would like to discuss these kinds of issues. And I think that as Chief uh, Charlo has mentioned, Clearly, there has to be greater interaction and an ability to adapt and overcome in this current environment where we make use of technology when in-person meetings aren't allowed. Madam Chair, if I could interject, please. I, I see Ms. Dawn has, uh, did you want to speak on your uh, comment? Oh, go ahead. Holly? Hi. Um, yeah, I just copied and pasted what was in this document. It's on what the, we're looking at page nine, 1.01, .01, I know. Um, Mr. Brown there brought it up on the screen with the, in terms of just the chart, but that was the response. Um, I would just say that I think our ad hoc group had some success talking about each recommendation that we had made and talking through what, where, kind of what the decision was at the time and then what's happened since that time. Um, to revisit if it made sense to ask the question, has there been progress or what are the next steps? Um, I mean, as an example for this one, this one's listed as partially implemented. Uh, and again, kind of just asking that question of what's the next step in implementing it per what has happened. So I, I just would recommend that I think it's a better use of everyone's time at the ad hoc committees get together and take the time to review because those are the groups that put the thought into each of the different issues. And let me turn it back to um, Captain Jordan to see if you, ha you, you have updates so that when we meet as ad hoc, we can take your, um, your updates when we gather again. 
So right. In our, in our last meeting, uh, Ms. Sandoval, I think you actually sent um, 10 recommendations that you wanted to review for updates. And then I was able to provide written updates for us to discuss as a group. Um, however, kind of on the fly here, not knowing where, which one we're gonna be hitting, it's hard for me to go back and say, okay, these 10 recommendations were covered, there's 20 left. I think when we develop the agenda, it might be uh, you know, very good to identify which ones we're going to address specifically. This way I can craft a written response, then we can discuss what we have done, what we haven't done, and then be specific. Because when I read this recommendation, it seemed to be focused on new officers placed within their commands but now you're asking kind of a follow-up question about commanding officers and how they're placed. And I'd be happy to kind of sit down with the chiefs and the CEC, the chief's executive committee about their thoughts. And to the extent that Chief Neslite will be here in May, maybe he can provide some additional thoughts about his feelings about where he selects commanding officers and the commands that they're gonna to go to and why. Okay. Ms. Jenkins, you had a question. You know, I was going to say a lot of what, what Polly said, essentially, you know, where they did indicate in their initial response that it was um, a partially resolved matter, but, but that they were also analyzing how they could, you know, further respond to the, the proposal and the concerns of the board and the community. So, I mean, I think under those circumstances, anywhere where the response is either partial or analyzing, um, those would be the points at which we would need, um, you know, updates so that we know when we get to the point of, of full uh, implementation of the recommendation and or a, a reject of rejection of the recommendation and, and then an explanation as to why the recommendation is, is being rejected. But um, I also, you know, appreciate um, Chair Sandoval, you know, the, the uh, correlation or the connection that you made between, um, you know, what, what happened with the replacement of the captain in Southeastern Division and, you know, how going forward, if we're talking about community relations and partnership development between the community and the police force, how those decisions could be made in some sort of a collaborative process, um, you know, because if those kinds of opportunities are taken, uh, you know, maybe we could avoid um, some circumstances that we're, we're currently in and we can create an understanding upon appointment of, of new captains and new leaderships within a division for how the community um, you know, wants to partner and engage and, and what kind of dialogue they're seeking and what their concerns are. And no, um, Kevin Jordan, that we're, I'm not, I understand that there are times that, um, that you have to appoint a leader, but not including the community in that transition or even just having a meeting to inform um, and that's what I mean by engaging. Like, was the community engaged at all? And, and if so, in what way? Um, so that they do feel that, you know, they had to say in or part of that process. Um, but okay, I, I do see the, the importance and I'm looking at the time. So I'm gonna recommend that we move forward in, in, the, in the focus of the of pillar one, if our, ad hoc committees that made those recommendations, we could meet specifically on pillar ones and two. I think that one and two would be doable um, by the next meeting. And then we will send you the specific ones that we want um, SDPD to, to give us an update on, on where they're at, like my colleagues mentioned a minute ago. On, on what does that mean? What does it mean that it's fully implemented? How do we know it's been fully implemented? Was a policy passed? Was a procedure changed? how, or if the perception from CAB was wrong, uh, for example, in one case, we were under the, the understanding that curbing was still a practice and we were informed, no, it's not. So is there a policy that says no curbing is allowed? Uh, that would be the answer to that recommendation that we had uh, made back at that time, okay? Understood, and I think by putting it in writing and, and um, kind of advising the agenda with significant time in advance, um, and just so you know, these recommendations in some cases are a little complex. They do take a little bit of research and follow up um, in different areas within the department. 
So to the extent that I have um, uh, as advanced notice to the best of my ability, so I can give the most complete answer that I think the board is looking for, that would be helpful. Understood, thank you. Moving along on our agenda, the next item, Gerald. I think it was the action. Okay, the next item uh, on the agenda as I, as I scroll down here, as we, okay, on the wrong agenda. I'm sorry, I have several agendas up here. Um, was the ad hoc committees uh, working on the work plan? Working on so the I think that's plan. part of it, that, that we're gonna move forward with that. Right, and then of course the CAB outreach plan uh, with the executive team. Uh, and that's that's it, Madam Chair. And then, then we move on to our next meeting. We're adjourned at our next meeting on Monday, May 17th, 2021. Okay. So the next the next item would be Was this last? No, ma'am. This is this is this is the week. We Southeast Division follow up with, on CAB's 20 this uh, is last month. I'm sorry. This is the agenda from this month. No, this is the agenda for, for this month. And then, uh, of course, CAB's outreach plan. We're going to talk about that for five minutes. And then still working on CAB's uh, 2021 work plan. And that is the, uh, that is the last item. Let's see. Let me look at the agenda that I have on this side. Um, that was March. Madam Chair, I think because of the time, we won't be able to to do to do all of that. More, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and conclude here and um, an open roundtable. Uh, just know that we are looking towards possibly having a a meeting uh, between now and our next board meeting on on how we could move forward with those um with the protact ordinance to to learn more about it as well and be able to to keep cab more informed on that as well as training i think that cab has prioritized providing um protect your rights initiatives that we we need to continue um pushing for those and be able to be in those forums that we have in the community and as schools I and mean schools as um, we're able to reopen locations, we may be able to, to facilitate an on-site or continue doing the distance learning, know your rights um, forums. So with that, any other round table comments? Oh, I see Ms. Dade has a question. Are, are there any board members that have any round table items first? Okay, Ms. Dalia, go ahead. Thank you. I was just re reading the um, comment and I had to step away for a moment, but I was just reading a comment in the chat about um, the, uh, from Polly Dawn about opportunities existing to be utilized um, by the command personnel um, to obtain input, right? So. However, okay, that was, this is my question. So what if the command doesn't want to? What's the response if they push back for whatever reason? I'm just curious, what is the police department ready to do? Or has that even been a discussion? I'm curious. So as an advisory board, CAV can make recommendations uh, we don't set policies, so at this point, all we can really do is be advocates for the community on why and make a case about why that would behoove SDPD to take on so that it improves the community relations with the community and rebuild that trust that, you know, many members have lost. Does, um, so, yes, I, yes, I understand that, of course, as an advisory board. Um, my question is though, as an advisory board, say they, some commands, you know, the, your, it's reported back here that some commands aren't taking up 
this advisory recommendation, would the advisory board then go back and and inquire as to what what is the issue? Um, is there additional probing that's going to happen? You know, trying to get down to the root cause or the not the root cause, but well, yeah, the root cause or the reasoning behind it in order for you to then go back and address it again. So very much like today that um, I I inquired more on the engagement whenever an individual is placed into a division. And originally the conversation was on officers, but now there's a situation in our community that engaged in it's dealing with the captain. So now that pushes us to make that second question, right? So mm -hmm. it, it, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, and to the point that you're saying that, yes, it does take time because, um, well, it's a process and it's a system that we're trying to, to work with to be able to uh, move certain initiatives that the community wants um, that they're not always going to, to take immediately or at all. So um, our purpose is to really advocate, like I said, and continue to say why that initiative would behoove the police department to take. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's it's their decision and the mayor's decision over them. Yeah. And we are at time, um, but I invite Ms. Dada, if you could also reach out just like Ms. Williamson to, to sit down and have those conversations with myself and, and other or other board members on, on CAB so that we do understand the, the voice of the community uh, as we make these recommendations. Thank you very much to everyone. And I appreciate you allowing me time to speak. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if no other comments from any other board members, I call this meeting, I'm concluding this meeting. <laughs> the, the minutes will be sent to Gerald and the executive team in a couple of minutes. Robert, you're on it. I want it to get done. <laughs> Thank you. Have a nice one, everyone. You too.